Thank you. I appreciate you guys. I'll uh, get right into it. Our time is scarce. The biggest threats to liberty today, and I'll tell you this from my vantage point, as a 37-year-old, I'm the first millennial ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'll tell you this as a member of my generation, the threats to liberty today are different than they were back in 1980. Back in 1980, it was the administrative state. Ronald Reagan came in to clean that up. That's fine. That's 1980 stuff. Today, the threats are a hybrid of government power and private enterprise that together are able to do what neither one could do on its own. The government not suppressing speech directly, but telling social media companies to censor speech through the back door that the government could not censor through the front door under the Constitution. Can't get the Green New Deal through Congress, no problem. We will instead use financial institutions to get every bank in this country to sign a climate pledge to stop lending to Alaskan drilling or fossil fuel projects instead. Use the same agenda through the back door. We now see that pattern repeating itself with Bank of America turning over data on who withdrew money from their ATMs in places like Washington, D.C. around January of 2021. That is the real threat to liberty and prosperity today. And the common thread that ties all of those things up is fiat money itself. That is exactly how the government is able to use its hybrid of power with the big business in this country to be able to get done through the back door what it couldn't get done through the front door. So one of the things I've said in this presidential campaign is that we will make the 2024 election a referendum on sound money in the United States. Thank you. I appreciate that. And the reason that I'm here is that I need you guys in order to do it. I'll tell you why. What I've said is I'm in this to actually put the Federal Reserve back in its place to restore the single mandate of stabilizing the U.S. dollar as a unit of measurement. Abandon the dual mandate, trying to play financial god, hitting two targets with one arrow, in the end hitting neither, inflation and unemployment. You think about stabilizing the dollar, the dollar is as volatile as it is. If the number of minutes in an hour varied as much as the dollar does, None of us would be here at the same time. We'd be walking in and out. Well, guess what? The dollar, when it's as volatile as it is, that's a headwind for economic growth in this country. So what I want to do is put the Fed back in its place, go back to stabilizing the dollar as a unit of measurement, stop trying to supposedly smooth over the business cycle, which in fact causes more financial crises in the process. That's what I want to do. But here's the problem. That requires a 90% headcount reduction at the Federal Reserve. And if you strike the swamp, the swamp strikes back at you. That's where you all come in. You are the backstop. So when I'm, if I'm elected president of the United States and taken on the Federal Reserve, what I need is people in this country to actually have an alternative to that system. That is the backstop that actually keeps our existing financial system intact. And I'll tell you something. If you're threatened by competition, that means that you were never secure about your own value proposition in the first place. Thank you. So now they're coming for me for the same reasons they will be coming for you. Here's how they're coming for you. Now you see it in the, in the budget. 30% possible excise tax on mining for Bitcoin or for digital assets in particular. That is wrong. You do not use punishments for a specific use of energy. One of the things I've said is that you don't want any special favors. Well, then guess what? You don't get any special punishments in return either. We need the government out of your hair rather than regulating what kind of energy is actually used for what purposes. Fair treatment for all. I'll tell you this too. Thank you. I'll tell you this too. How are they going to implement that? Think about it. That means it requires an entire surveillance state to go along with it. 
to be able to know whether or not someone is using it for mining, you had to be able to surveil whether or not someone was using it for mining. Free, freedom of speech and freedom of money are two sides of the same coin in this country. That is what we need to re revive and respect. The other way they're coming, or likely to come, is ensnaring Bitcoin in the morass that is our securities regulations in this country. I'm glad that the current SEC chair has temporarily said that he would not characterize Bitcoin as a security. Well, we need to keep it that way. This can't be just federal enforcement discretion. We have to codify that in the rules itself. Write it into the rules. For the very reasons why Bitcoin is finite in its quantity, there is no issuer. It should never be treated as a security under the current securities laws. To the contrary, this is a laboratory for innovation where actually the existing broken securities regulation regime can actually learn something from a new system rather than to be threatened by it. This is what we're going to need is to embrace a parallel competitive system that's different than the one we have today. Now, mark my words, for skating to where the puck is going, here's what's going to happen a year or two from now. You turn off the government's ability to overreach, they will use the private sector to do it through the back door. Companies go in public, listing publicly now. Turns out those publicly traded companies are owned by a small handful of financial institutions. Institutions like BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, that today are using the money of everyday citizens to tell companies like Chevron to adopt scope three emissions caps, or companies like Apple to adopt hiring policies that the company didn't want to adopt. You mark my words, where this puck is now going is that as, for example, companies in the Bitcoin space go public, the thing we now have to watch out for is making sure that they don't use ESG or other standards to do through the back door what government could not then get done through the front door under the Constitution. That's the new frontier. And we need to be alert to it. Central bank digital currencies are the mechanism for enforcing that social credit system. We need a president who is going to stand by with a spine saying that we will have zero tolerance for seeing that move forward from the federal government. Need to keep it ultimately in the hands of the people. So this is, this is what we can create, is a parallel alternative system where, you know what, you don't get any special favors, you don't get any special punishment in return. Competition actually breeds innovation. I think the government needs to be less insecure, more secure in its own value proposition rather than going after people who actually offer alternatives. That's what it means to be an American. We're the pioneers. We're the explorers, the people who will chart a new course in whatever direction is given to us. I'll tell you, Thomas Jefferson, he would have been mining for Bitcoin if he were alive today. I have little doubt about that. He invented the swivel chair while he was writing the Declaration of Independence. That's what he would be doing, swiveling in his chair with his, you know, let's just say, wig, white wig, whatever they have, laser eye, Thomas Jefferson. We should make a portrait of that. That's an American embodiment. It's who we are as a people. And it's not just about America. We can learn from other countries doing this well. El Salvador, at this conference, announced two years ago that it would accept Bitcoin as legal tender. Look what's happened in the meantime. Crime is down over 99% in that country. The murder rate is down over 99%. You want to know why? Is it because of Bitcoin? In part, it's because it reflects a national self-confidence, a nation that is confident enough to actually accept competition to its status quo is a nation that's confident enough to take on its own greatest challenges at home as well. We can learn from the countries that have already done it, bring that back home here. Think about one of the big risks that the next president of the United States is going to face, the risk that China invades or annexes Taiwan. The key challenge is how do we actually preserve national autonomy in places like Taiwan without actually going to war with China? I'll offer an unconventional idea for you. I think the widespread use of Bitcoin by the Taiwanese people will make Xi Jinping think twice 
before he goes for Taiwan because there's no central node of capture. These can be the American exports, right? We should be the home of financial innovation, of actually self-confidence that says that, you know what, if you have a system that challenges the status quo, we're confident enough to actually embrace that rather than to reject it. So the reason I'm here is to tell you that if I'm elected president, my focus is on reforming the Federal Reserve. But we're not going to be able to do it without an actual alternative that serves as a backstop on that broken administrative state as it exists today. And that is where you all come in. Keep doing what you're doing. I will keep the government out of your hair, and that's going to be good not just for Bitcoin or for you all in this room. That is going to be good for our country. What we need to do, thank you, is in the Republican Party now, these issues are beyond the pale of discussion. There's this thing called the Overton window, what you're allowed to discuss in polite company. In the polite company of the Republican Party, these, ad these ideas are far outside the pale. In this campaign, we're driving a truck through that Overton window, blowing it out wide to be able to understand the root causes of what many Republicans complain about, right? They'll complain about ESG, ESG or CBDCs or the rise of a woke industrial complex in America without actually getting to the root cause. We can complain about the symptoms all we want. We're not going to address the cancer until we address the root cause itself. And the root cause of a lot of our economic stagnation and then the cultural stagnation that comes along with it is actually the abuse of fiat money itself. And if we restore the dollar as a stable unit of measurement, take a basket of commodities, peg the dollar back to it, we go back to four plus percent GDP growth in this country, just like we had back when the dollar was on the gold standard before 1972. We, if we can't go back to that, we're going to move back to a future where at least the dollar is stable, Bitcoin can thrive, there are alternatives to the system. If the Fed refuses to reform itself, that puts me in a position to hold their feet to the fire. The next step for me, thank you, the next step for me, January 2025 is when the next president takes U.S. office. But the next step is actually August of this year, three months from now the first Republican primary debate that we'll be having. Right now, these issues are beyond the scope of what the Republican Party cares to discuss, what the Republican current establishment considers the important issues. Fiat money and the problems associated with it are not on the list. Reform of the Federal Reserve is not on the list. Bitcoin certainly is not on the list. What I want to ask you to do is to help me and put me in a position to elevate to the forefront of the Republican primary debates the issue of sound money and Federal Reserve reform in this election. That first debate is in August of this year. Thank you. And you know who gets to decide what issues make it to the forefront? You all do. I'm actually here to tell you today that the secret standard that's been shared with all of the candidates is in the Republican Party, you need 40,000 unique donations. It can be $1, but 40,000 unique donations to make it onto that debate stage. We've already met the polling thresholds. We're at a little over 35,000 as of today. The reason I'm here is that I want the Bitcoin community to be the one that pushes me over the line at 40,000. You guys put me in the position, we will actually raise the issue of sound money at the forefront of this Republican primary process, at the forefront of the 2024 presidential election. That QR code takes you today, I'm pleased to announce that we're the first GOP campaign in this cycle to accept Bitcoin as a unit of currency for donations. And the first GOP candidate ever to use the Lightning Network to do it. So we're at over 35,000 now. You take a dollar's worth of Bitcoin, pull out your phones, go to that QR code now. You push us over 40,000. You do your part. 
Come August, I will do mine on that debate stage all the way through January 2025 when we restore, finally, a system with actual integrity, puts meaning back into what it means to actually hold a dollar. And part of what's going to allow us to do it is bringing healthy competition to the dollar itself. Get your phones out. Give a dollar. Put me on that debate stage. And in August, I will not let you down. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Warm welcome from the Bitcoin community. And we'll be back and see you here next year. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Bitcoiners, welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine Live Desk presented by Marathon. Back with the same panel. Wow, what a speech, what a presentation. So many one-liners. I'm very curious what the panel thinks. Let's start with Stacey. He missed the opportunity to ask for $21. Nevertheless, I will give him $21 in order to see him on the debate stage. And as I said the last time, obviously he was inspired by President Bukele. Uh, the most popular leader in the world is going to drive uh, campaigns around the world. Look, the problem is this, as uh, iterated in Bitcoin Magazine, the gatekeepers. There's a lot of nefarious people in government who don't want these truths that we hold self-evident from making their way back into public discourse. There's a deep, deep cancer in our political system. So I don't think that the politics is going to make it work in America. It's got to be a grassroots insurrection. <laughs> grassroots insurrection. Harry, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm always here to root for an Ohio boy. So we, we love that Vivek's from the great state of Ohio. Um, and, you know, I think what's so fascinating is that, you know, he's really bringing a free market approach to his campaign and to his, you know, donation strategy, but also to the U.S. dollar. You know, I look forward to Bitcoin competing in that environment. I still believe that it's the apex money that we're dealing with. But if he wants to bring a stronger competitor via the dollar, we welcome it. I really thought that that was an amazing speech, but we were kind of talking, and I was like, awesome speech, lame solution, like, I'm going to fix the dollar. What's up with that, Max? Right. Well, I mean, politics and Bitcoin in 2023, as Stacy points out, they see what's happening in El Salvador, and everyone wants to jump on uh, the bandwagon because they know now that it's a vote getter, it's a vote winner, and it's a path toward uh, uh, political excellence. But, you know, the language is there and the words are there, but is the philosophy there? Is the understanding, the deep understanding of Bitcoin there? I mean, Vivek, I mean, I just heard about this guy the second he went on the air. I mean, has he got the pedigree? Has he got the Bitcoin philosophy? Has he read all of the necessary texts and books to get deep in? Has, does he read Bitcoin Magazine? I didn't hear him mention Bitcoin Magazine. Well, hey, Max, he did mention El Salvador. Stacy, you said before he even went on that, Bukele is, is the inspiration here. El Salvador is the inspiration here. And then he brought up El Salvador and Bukele. What do you think about that? Well, what he said about President Bukele was quite interesting. He said that it had given us national self-confidence. And I, I think that is quite remarkable. And you do see the transformation in the security. Uh, peace has finally arrived in the country. And there is a confidence there. So I was a little bit disappointed because I was w watching him. He was... 37, the same age that President Bukele was when he was running for president, that I thought he would have the self-confidence as he delivered that to have a better solution. And just like, say, we could be a Bitcoin country as well, instead of trying to reform a very corrupt institution uh, that should just be torn down, because it is corrupt to its base. So why uh, try to reform it? But I do believe the U.S. dollar and U.S. treasuries have been a great layer one money uh, for quite a period of time. Yeah, well, I mean, hey, again, I really do think that he needs to take that next step to say Bitcoin, but I loved a lot, a lot, a lot of what he had to cover here. That is all the time we have here. Make sure to smash like, make sure to smash subscribe, and we'll see you back here at the desk.